Section 10 of A Rip and Winkle of the Kalahari Seven Tales of Southwest Africa by Frederick Carruthers Cornell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Fortune The Crater and the Pleasant Berry Sleep and the Awakening Part 2 The water was clear as crystal and now I could see clearly why it had looked so white and sparkled so when seen through the rippling surface. Stretched upon the white sand lay the chalk-white skeleton of a man, the grinning mouth and sightless eyes staring up at me in a hideous travesty of mirth, and all around between the outstretched bones lay diamonds, diamonds innumerable, big, bright, sparkling beauties by the handful, wealth incredible to be had, for the picking up, with no guardian other than these bare bones of a long dead man. The shock of coming face to face with this grim memento mori here in the depths of the pool was too much, even for my desire for the diamonds, and I struck frantically for the surface, clambering out in wild, senseless, unreasoning fear and not even pausing till I was well away from the vicinity of the spot, which had been my favourite resting place for so long. And that night I tried in vain to sleep, my brain whirling with wild surmises as to how the long-dead man had found his way into the crater. Was there a path after all, or had he used a rope to let himself down in search of the diamonds, only to meet his death in some manner where they lay thickest? Or had he, perchance, passed years in the trap, vainly endeavouring to find a way out, pacing day after day round the ring of encircling cliffs, until at last, in utter despair, he had thrown himself into the pool to end it all, and to leave his bones there watching the treasure he could not take with him? Each time I closed my eyes, the mocking, grinning skeleton seemed to be again before me, and it was not till early morning that I could rest. But with the day my fears vanished. Indeed, what was there to fear? For how could these few poor bones harm me? Still, I could not bring myself to dive into the pool again, but set about devising some other means of getting the diamonds. An empty gourd, cut into the shape of a bowl, and lashed to a stick, solved the difficulty, and with this primitive dredge I brought up diamonds sufficient for a king's ransom. So many, indeed, that long before night, even I was satisfied. Large, lustrous stones they were, of splendid water, and several of them were blue, though none were as fine as the one Inyati had given me. So, here was wealth, far beyond my wildest dreams, and if I could but escape, then, even disfigured as I was, life might still hold pleasures for me. Even if the girl who had sent me to this turned away in horror from my hideous disfigurements, there was much that money could bring. Travel, adventure, sport, a thousand things, and at any rate, the companionship of rational beings, for which I now craved as I had craved for water in the desert. For God knows how long I had seen no human being, no living creature indeed, but a few birds, and I had almost forgotten the sound of a human voice. Sunk in apathy, I had become almost as a beast, but the sight of the diamonds had aroused me, and I recalled how poor Inyati had called them magic stones. Magic indeed, for they had saved my reason. And with the sight of all this wealth, the desire to escape grew stronger, and with it grew a hatred of my hitherto pleasant prison until the thought of remaining in it became intolerable to me. That very evening I began a minute examination of my prison walls, but it was not till several days had passed that I at length discovered a route, where here a crack, there a tiny ledge, and again a small projection, offered a precarious chance of foot or handhold, and where, if anywhere at all, a human being might essay the terrible climb to the desert above, with a remote chance of success. My mind made up on this point, 
I made what preparation I could for the climb and for the desert beyond it. My water bottle was still sound, and little as it held, it must suffice. For food, I killed a number of the partridges and roasted them, cutting away their plump breasts from the bone, for I realised that in the terrible climb before me, every ounce would tell. My knife, revolver and a few cartridges, I made a belt for by plaiting the strong coarse grass that grew near the water, and of the same material I made a hat, for I remembered only too well that I should find no shade in the desert should I succeed in my desperate attempt. Shoes? I had none, but this did not trouble me, for my feet were hardened to the consistency of leather. The diamonds I made into a bundle with some shreds of clothing, and stowed them in the canvas haversack, except for Nyartes and a few other blue ones, which I luckily put in my pocket. All these belongings I conveyed one evening to the foot of the cliff, up which I intended attempting to climb, sleeping at the spot so as to be ready and fresh for a start at daybreak. I feared little as to my strength, for, in spite of my injuries, I was now stronger than I had ever been, but what I did fear was vertigo. From a child I had always had a horror of looking down from a great height, feeling an almost irresistible desire to throw myself down whenever I did so, and I feared that as I neared the top this would happen and I should be dashed again to the floor of the crater. But better that and death than this endless captivity, and I did not shrink from my formidable undertaking. At early dawn I drank deep from the gushing water that I was leaving, and fastening on my load I began to climb. For a time all went well, though of necessity my progress was but slow, and the sun was full overhead when I halted for a rest on a small ledge about halfway up. Here for the first time since I started I could lie at full length without having to hold on, and I needed the rest for the strain had been terrific, and I feared that the worst part of the climb was still to come. So far I had resisted all inclination to look down, but shortly after leaving the ledge I was compelled to do so. I had been following a crack running diagonally up from it, and which from below had appeared to connect with another ledge favourable to me. But to my consternation I found that this was not the case. Ten or twelve feet of absolutely smooth and vertical rock, cutting me off from my coveted path to freedom. I was flattened against the wall, my heels overhanging the abyss, clutching with one hand a projection above me and feeling with my other for a new grip. But the rock was as smooth as polished marble, and it was evident that I must work back to the ledge I had rested on and try for a new route. And to do this I had of necessity to look down. As I did so, the deadly vertigo I feared so much came over me, and it was well that I had good hand and foothold, or I should certainly have fallen. As it was, I clung helpless, sick and giddy, with closed eyes for some time, and it was only by the strongest effort of my will that I could force myself to again open them and work my way gradually back to the little ledge. There I threw myself down, panting and deadly sick, the whole world seeming to spin round me, and there I lay for some time, inert and helpless, before I could brace myself sufficiently for a further effort. At length I roused myself and started up again in another direction, towards where I could see a few stunted bushes growing, and here, to my joy, I found a wider ledge than the last, leading steeply upwards. It came to an end, however, far below the cliff top. Moreover, at this part, the top actually overhung me, and it was evident I must attempt to work my way farther round before climbing higher. To add to my anxiety, I noticed now that evening was fast approaching, and I realised that I had but little daylight left to me, and should darkness find me still clinging like a fly to the face of the cliff, my fate was certain. I was almost exhausted, and my heart sank as I searched in vain for a way up. The distance was not great now, 
a bare fifty feet separating me from the topmost pinnacle. But though I walked along the bottom of this barrier for some distance, it still presented the same insurmountable difficulties. And the sun had set, and dusk was already falling, when half frantic with fear, I at length made out a crevice which appeared to offer a possible means of saving my life. It ran diagonally across the rock at a steep angle upwards, going out of my sight around a big buttress that overhung me, and I could not tell whether it reached to the actual top or not, but it was my only chance, and with my heart in my mouth I made my way towards it. I could just reach it, and setting my teeth and summoning all my courage, I gripped it fast and made my way gradually upward. For a few yards my feet found a little foothold to help me, but soon I was dangling over the awful abyss. I dare not think of what lay below me, but with set teeth and muscles cracking with the strain, I edged gradually along till I rounded the buttress face, and here within ten feet of the summit I found scanty foothold again. Here I stood quivering and exhausted till I had regained my breath, and then in the fast waning light I examined the few feet of rock that still stood between me and freedom. Barely two feet above my outstretched hand was the pinnacle that formed the edge of the cliff, but how was I to reach it? To spring from my precarious foothold was impossible, and not the slightest hold could I find for my fingers anywhere to draw myself up. Night was now upon me. To return to the ledge was out of the question, and I knew that I could not cling for long where I was, but that long before daylight came again I must fall into the awful abyss that yawned beneath me. God, to die like this after all my struggle, to die within a few inches of freedom, had I but a rope, and with the thought came inspiration, the sling of the haversack. It was of stout, strong canvas, and might hold, could I but throw the loop over the pinnacle. It was a poor chance, but my only one. Hastily slipping it off, I held the bag in my right hand, and clutching my only handhold with the left, I attempted to throw the loop over the sharp point above me. Again and again I missed, and it was in an agony of despair when at last... It fell clear over the point and held. I hauled at it with all the strength of my free arm, and it held firm. But would it hold my weight? This I could not test, but I must perforce stake all upon the chance, for there was no other chance. Should a strand of the canvas give, down I must go, hurtling to my death. There was no other way and with an inarticulate prayer, I gripped the strap fast with my other hand and swung myself upwards. A second later, although in my agony it seemed an eternity, and my hand clutched the pinnacle itself. A wild, convulsive scramble, and I was up, safe and free at last. And even as I dragged myself into freedom, the haversack, loosened from its hold, fell with all its precious contents into the black depths. End of section 10, recording by Leanne Fortune, South Africa.